The sound seminar you're about to hear was recorded at the Poetry Center of the New York YMYWHA on December 19, 1963. This program presents Walter Kaufman lecturing on Homer and the birth of tragedy. A fuller commentary on this subject may be obtained by reading Mr. Kaufman's book, Tragedy and Philosophy, published by Doubleday and Company. Tonight, I want to talk about Homer and the birth of tragedy, and that seems odd, perhaps in a somewhat different way. It seems odd because some of you may feel why bring in Homer at this point. He didn't write tragedies. And couldn't I rather, if I have this uh, last lecture, bring in Euripides, who did write tragedies. To this, I'll give a very brief preliminary answer, and then the main answer will be in the lecture itself. First of all, at the minor point, uh, Plato did call Homer a tragic poet, but that in itself would be a poor excuse for giving a lecture on Homer in this series. Secondly, and this I mentioned at the outset, Euripides wrote a great many works. We still have 18 or 19 of them, and that's too many for discussion in one evening. Well, the Iliad is a single work with which, I hope, one can deal fruitfully in a single evening. Now, there's one problem in connection with the Iliad and the name of Homer, and that is that, as no doubt very many of you are aware, there has been a vast amount of scholarly discussion about the authorship of the Iliad and the Odyssey. There's the question to what extent Either of these poems can be credited to a single poet rather than a whole group of bards, and the further question whether both poems can be credited to the same single poet. I will somewhat peremptorily venture an opinion on that, and that is that it seems pretty clear that the Iliad utilizes the work of many poets. It also seems to me that when one reads the Iliad straight through, from beginning to end, one is bound to be so struck by the excellence of its form, by the tightness and beauty of its organization, that it's reasonable to suppose that there is some one man who is responsible for this forming of the subject matter. And this man, I shall tonight during this lecture, call Homer, the poet of the Iliad. I do not believe that it was the same poet who gave the Odyssey its final form, but uh, that need not concern us very much tonight, since I do not plan to talk about the Odyssey, but just about the Iliad. And with this, I want to stop with preliminaries and do what I want to do, and I very much hope that by the time I finish, you will see why I did it. Most of the lecture, will be concerned with a comparison of Aeschylus' tragedies to the Iliad, or of Aeschylus and the Homer of the Iliad. And in this larger part of the lecture, I will first dwell on points they have in common, then on differences, and then I will deal to some extent with the function of the gods in Homer and in Aeschylus. Then secondly, I will deal much more briefly with Sophocles, the other great tragic poet with whom I've dealt in this series. And then there will be finally a conclusion, which I hope will show why I find Homer so relevant to my theme. And if by that time you don't agree with me that he is relevant, then there's nothing further I can do. To begin with a common element between Aeschylus and Homer, just first of all, and this may seem trivial, the form. But uh, it isn't always when one compares two poets that uh, they are both very, very great poets and that they both wrote in the same language, namely Greek. The first thing they have in common, they're comparable in this. Then, still under the heading of form, it is relevant to note that approximately half of the Iliad consists of speeches. One doesn't usually think of it that way, it is not printed as a drama. But the moment somebody points out that approximately half of it consists of speeches, you see that this is a very strong common element with tragedy. Then next, and this perhaps even less meets the eye in spite of the very first line of the poem, the Iliad, although it is an epic and longer than any work of Aeschylus, does deal with a single theme, the wrath of Achilles. 
gender deals, and this even less meets the eye, it deals with an extremely short span of time. It would have to be somewhat pedantic to calculate now exactly how many days it is, but it really is very few days. And any material that lies outside this span of a few days is introduced in features, just as it would be in a tragedy. Moreover, as the last point to mention under the heading of form, so this leads us from form to content, we find in Homer as well as in Aeschylus, a fusion of intense intellectual interest with intense passion. The intellectual interest, I will come to that later on, is uh, not particularly philosophical, but it is a bright-eyed interest in just about anything that comes up. Secondly, what the two poets have in common is an emphasis on the terrors of life. And in this, I have found the common element of the 14 Greek tragedies of Aeschylus and Sophocles, that they put into the center of our attention suffering, the terrors of human existence. We can uh, say further of Homer that it is the suffering that is brought on by blind passion that is at the center. The blind passion is primarily the wrath of Achilles, which is not directed in exactly the same direction throughout. It's first directed at Agamemnon and the Greeks, later it is uh, aimed at Hector and the Trojans. But throughout, the emphasis is on the detail of the great suffering that man's passion brings about. And at the same time, there's also an emphasis on the majesty of such passion. There's something great about this passion, even though it brings about suffering. And for that matter, there's something glorious about the suffering. And the suffering itself is described uh, with a real feeling for the glory of it. There's throughout a great concern with death. People have counted up the number of uh, deaths in Leah. And in Hamlet, I don't know whether anybody has ever counted up the number of deaths in the Iliad. Could be done, but the number would be incomparably greater. And the concern with death uh, can even be narrowed down, and we can say that it is especially, if not only, an interest in violent death and in killing. Thirdly, the principle of order in the Iliad as also, I believe, in Greek tragedy, is the contest. When I speak of the contest in connection with Greek tragedy, presumably the first thing that many of you will think of is that the tragedians were engaged in a contest against each other, who was to win first prize and who second and who only third. But that is not what I mean. Within each tragedy, there is also typically a contest, a conflict, one side against the other. It is not always equally obvious. It is particularly obvious in the Antigone of Sophocles, where you have the contest between Antigone and Creon. It is obvious in the suppliance of Aeschylus, the contest between the suppliants and their pursuers, in Prometheus versus Zeus, in the Oresteia in the first play, Clytemnestra versus Agamemnon, then the second one, Orestes against Clytemnestra, and the last one, at least in the last part of it, Athene against the humanity. The war that Homer describes for us is described not merely as any war would be, a contest between two sides, but as a series of contests. One can look at a war differently, perhaps uh, the most obvious example of quite a different approach to war that comes to mind is a book that had the great novelty of looking at war quite differently, in Western it's Neues, All Quiet on the Western Front after World War I. In the Iliad, we get one contest after another, and then organizing the whole thing, there is first of all Achilles against Agamemnon and the Achaeans, and then Achilles against Hector, and finally, Achilles against Priam. 
These are three points. The commonness of the form, the emphasis on the terrors of life, the contest as the principle of order. It seems to me to be one more major point of comparison, and that is the almost incomparable humanity that Homer establishes at the dawn of Greek poetry, a humanity that notably includes the enemy. I'm going to quote a good deal from uh, the Iliad tonight. Most of the quotations will be brief. A few will be a little longer. They are all taken from Rieu's Penguin Edition, which is in prose, but seems to me to have the great advantage for our purposes of being very literal, and we don't want to have our comparisons vitiated by padding that is brought in for the sake of the poetry, but that isn't really quite what the poet said. The uh, first quotation is very brief. It's from Book 5. Diomedes slew them both, leaving their father brokenhearted. An extremely odd way, surely, to report so briefly one of the exploits of one of the most lovable and most admired heroes of the Ilgad. He slew them both, leaving their father brokenhearted. The enemy is always a human being, and he is a human being who also has a father, and there is no blindness as to what that means. My second illustration comes from Book 11. Here again, it's Diomedes who speaks. A shot from a coward and milksop does no harm. He has a chivalrous idea that to use bow and arrow is somehow contemptible. A shot from a coward and milksop does no harm. But my weapons have a better edge. One touch from them and a man is dead. His wife has lacerated cheeks and his children have no father. Exactly the same point. The outstanding example of this humane attitude for the enemy is, of course, the figure of Hector, the leader of the Trojans in the fight, who is treated with complete chivalry and humanity by the poet, although obviously at one point not by Achilles. But there is uh, no suggestion anywhere that Hector, because he is a Trojan, is mean or hateful. The prime example of the treatment of Hector we find in Book 6, sometimes called the Book of Hector and Andromache, and quite especially this reaches its climax when Hector takes leave of Andromache, and I rather suppose this will be my longest quotation tonight. Andromache says to Hector, and I will leave out sentences and lines without signaling that to make it a little shorter. Hector, says his wife, Hector, she said, you are possessed. This bravery of yours will be your end. I have no father, no mother now. My father fell to the great Achilles when he sacked our lovely town. I had seven brothers, two at home, and one day all of them went down to Hades' house. The great Achilles of the swift feet killed them all. As for my mother, who was queen in Thebes under the woods of Placus, Achilles brought her here with the rest of his spoils, but freed her for princely ransom, and she was killed by Artemis, the archpress, in her father's house. So you, Hector, are father and mother and brother to me, as well as my beloved husband. Have pity on me now. Stay here on the tower, and do not make your boy an orphan and your wife a widow. Rally the Trojans for the pig tree there, where the wall is easiest to scale and the town most open to attack. Three times already their best men under the two Ayantes and the famous Domineia, the Atridae and the formidable Diomedes have a thought at that point. Said the great Hector, if I hid myself like a coward and refused to fight, I could never face the Trojans and the Trojan ladies and their trailing gowns. I have trained myself always like a good soldier to take my place in the front line and win glory for my father and myself. Deep in my heart I know the day is coming when holy Ilium will be destroyed with Priam and the people of Priam of the good atmosphere. The 
that I'm not so much distressed by the thought of what the Trojans will suffer, or Hecabe herself, or King Priam, or all my gallant brothers whom the enemy will fling down in the dust, as by the thought of you dragged off in tears by some Achaean men at arms to slavery. I see you then, Argos, toiling for some other woman at the loom, or carrying water from an alien well, a helpless drudge with no will of your own. There goes the wife of Hector to the save and the your tears. He was a champion of the horse-spinning Trojans when Hildum was deceived. And every time they say it, you will feel another pang at the loss of the one man who might have kept you free. Ah, uh, may the earth lie deep on my dead body before I hear the scream to utter the drag you off. As he finished, glorious Hector held out his arms to take his boy. But the child shrank back with a cry to the bosom of his girdled nurse, alarmed by his father's appearance. He was frightened by the bronze of the helmet and the horsehair plume that he saw nodding grimly down at him. His father and his lady mother had to laugh. But noble Hector quickly took his helmet off and put the dazzling thing on the ground. Then he kissed his son, dandled him in his arms, and prayed to Zeus and the other gods. Zeus and you other gods, grant that this boy of mine may be like me, preeminent in Troy, as strong and brave as I, a mighty king of Ilgium. May people say when he comes back from battle, he is a better man than his father. Let him bring home the blood-stained armor of the enemy he has killed, and make his mother happy. Then, after giving the boy back to his mother, my dear, I beg you not to be too much distressed. No one is going to send me down to Hades before my proper time. But fate is a thing that no man born of woman, coward or hero, can escape. War is men's business, and this war is the business of every man in Ilja, myself above all. As he spoke, Lord Yasekta picked up his helmet with its horsehair plume, and his wife set out for home, spreading great tears and with many a backward look. He soon got home, and there in the palace of Hector, killer of men, he found a number of their women servants and stirred them all to lamentation. So they mourned for Hector in his own house, so he was still alive. And you consider the treatment, the extraordinary treatment of the Persians in the play, the Persians by Aeschylus, who had fought against the Persians and considered that one of the most important things he had ever done. When you consider the daring of Aeschylus and bringing on the stage not a single Greek, but the mother of Xerxes, Atossa, and treating her regally as the empress of Persia, then you can see the continuity that I have in mind. This is not just a matter of Homer here, and one play by Aeschylus there, you can turn to the other plays of Aeschylus. Turn, for example, to the Seven Against Thebes. There is not the slightest presumption that Ateocles, who is more or less the hero of that play, is in the right, and that his brother Polynices, who comes leading the Seven Against Thebes, is in the wrong. It is quite clear that Ateocles is not in the right. For that matter, neither is Polynices. There is no feeling of hatred about the enemy, no feeling that I am human and he is not. Similarly in the Prometheus. Neither Prometheus is entirely right, perhaps, nor Zeus entirely right. In the Oresteia, Titanestra is no mere fiend whom one might conceivably, if one were on that lower level, boo when she first comes on stage. And if this seems a slight point, contrast like an extra even with her closest counterpart in Shakespeare, Lady Macbeth. There's an important difference. Like Nestra, who does the evil deed comparable to Lady Macbeth, is somehow a human being with some right on her side, too. This is a common element which we can perhaps express by saying that in Homer and Greek tragedy after him, Chivalry has been sublimated into a view of life. Even Aegisthus, although he is certainly not one of 
Aeschylus favorites, far from it, even he has some right. The idea is that not only was there once a great war between worthy opponents, but rather that in man's conflict with man there's typically some humanity on both sides and some right on both sides. That's a terribly important common element. To conclude the common element, I will give finally some miscellaneous illustrations that seem to me not to compare in importance with, I, with what I've just mentioned. They are very minor in comparison, but still, I think, just worth mentioning. The first point is that one thing that seems striking about Aeschylus, this particular point seems to distinguish Aeschylus from Sophocles and Euripides, is the extraordinary use he makes of the third actor. He borrows from Sophocles the innovation that three actors can be on the stage at one time with speaking roles, but even before that, sometimes where three, three were on the stage at one time, but one of them would not speak. And what Aeschylus does when he introduces the third actor is frequently, most importantly, but not only, in the Agamemnon, to have the third actor silent for a long time, and when the third actor finally speaks, it is as if there were a sudden clap of thunder or lightning, because it is so unexpected that this person, of whom the audience, at least the first time, had come to assume that he would not speak, suddenly bursts out. In the Agamemnon, the famous example is that Cassandra, for so very long, doesn't speak that the audience may suppose that she doesn't have a speaking part, and when she then suddenly does speak, the experience is overwhelming. Something like that, it seems to me, happens in the Iliad already. The Iliad begins, or almost begins, terribly near the beginning. In the first book, Briseis is taken away from Achilles and taken to Agamemnon's tent. This is what the wrath of Achilles is initially about, that a girl that had been allotted to him is taken by Agamemnon. Briseis is throughout most of the poem what we might call, to use a modern term, and I use it quite deliberately, although it may seem offensive in this context, a status symbol. What matters is not any particular feeling that Achilles has had for her. There's no suggestion of any romantic emotion. It is the slight to him that here something has been given to him by the army to show what a great fighter he is, and then she is taken away, and this he feels is an indignity. But then suddenly, late in the poem, near the end, Briseis finally speaks. He has one speech. But here we have the woman who has been more or less in focus throughout the poem, and finally she speaks, and one wonders whether the experience will be as horrible as sometimes when one sees a striking woman and wishes afterwards she had not opened her mouth. Here's Briseis' lament. So Briseis came back, beautiful as golden Aphrodite. But when she saw Patroclus lying there, mangled by the far bronze, she gave a piercing scream, threw herself on his dead body and tore her breast and tender neck and her fair cheeks with her hands. Lovely as a goddess in her grief, she cried, Alas, Patroclus, my heart's delight. Alas for me. I left you in the hut alive when I went away, and now I have come back, my prince, to find you dead. Such is my life, an endless train of misery. I saw the husband to my father and my lady mother gave me lie mangled in front of a city by the cruel bronze, and I saw my three brothers, my dear brothers, born by the same mother as myself, all meet their doom. But you, when the swift Achilles killed my man and sexing mine a city, you would not even let me be. You said you would make me Prince Achilles' lawful wife and take me in your ships to Sire and give me a wedding feast among the Myrmidons. You were so gentle with me always. How can I ever cease to mourn you? Seems to me a beautiful touch in which one feels belatedly that she was not just a set of symbol, but that she was a human being too, and a wonderful human being. 
The second one of these minor comparisons is that we find in Homer more than once, I think exactly twice, it might even be more often than that, but I think twice, the following sentiment expressed in the Iliad. Why do we load Hades more than any god, if not because he is so adamant and unyielding? This idea that there is something hateful about being unyielding, that there is something hateful about not having the humanity that is willing to give and take and to reason about things, this idea seems to me to be quite prominent in later Greek tragedy too. The other place in the Ilgid is where Zeus says to Ares, there's nothing you enjoy so much as quarreling and fighting, which is why I hate you more than any god on Olympus. It somehow felt to be something inhuman about it, and there is a great joy throughout uh, the uh, Ilgad when Athene scores triumph over Ares. He can take this, as I think it is too often taken, at Oh, too uh, crude a level by saying, well, Athena is on the Greek side and Ares is on the other side. But surely Athena is the goddess of wisdom and Ares is the god who enjoys fighting so much. And there is a real joy when somehow wisdom gets in a lick against Ares, the god of war. The other illustrations of this sort, I won't go into them now. I let the parallel stand there and turn now to the differences. The first great difference between Aeschylus and Homer seems to me to lie in Aeschylus' preoccupation with, seems a strong term, but I think entirely appropriate, with moral philosophy. Aeschylus is much less concerned than Homer with individuals much more with issues. In the Persians and in the Suppliants, there is clearly no hero. There is scarcely any interest whatsoever in any individual. In the Agamemnon, nothing of Agamemnon's life and adventures is of interest except what is relevant to the philosophical issue as to what justice consists in. Similarly with Clytemnestra, her relation to Aegisthus, her upbringing, her relation to her sister Helen, which would be psychologically quite interesting, what does it feel like to be the sister of the most beautiful woman in the world, all that does not matter at all. This is strictly irrelevant because what interests this poet, Aeschylus, is not the psychology of this individual Clytemnestra, but the philosophical issues that are at the center of the Oratea. And in the same way, what in the end becomes of Orestes is of no interest to him whatsoever. I think I can put this point most strongly and most emphatically in a way to which I can also come back once more, importantly for the end of this lecture, by saying that Aeschylus stands halfway between Homer and Plato. Formulation is not important. But what I mean by it, I think, is quite well put that way and strikes me as terribly important, that Aeschylus stands halfway between Homer and Plato. Homer is interested in the individual men, in their deeds of valor, and, of course, in hundreds of details that he finds interesting. Whom exactly Agamemnon killed? Whom Diomedes killed? Where the spear went in each time? where the spear came out at least half the time, how exactly death came, in what cases the entrails came out and in what cases they didn't, what the shield of Achilles looked like, as you know, in very great detail. All these things interest him enormously. All such things don't interest Aeschylus at all. One, perhaps, striking way, although it, uh, it may strike you as not on a very dignified level, brings out the difference that I have in mind, I think, very beautifully. 
to the end of uh, the Iliad before Achilles goes off to fight and get his man, Hector, there's suddenly a discussion between Achilles and Odysseus on whether one could or could not have breakfast before going into this fight. Achilles very emphatically does not feel like having breakfast. He wants to go out and kill Hector. But Odysseus thinks that it is advisable for the men to have a good breakfast uh, before they go out and fight, and many of them won't come back for the meal that they might be looking forward to, and so forth. Such a discussion about breakfast is simply unthinkable in Aeschylus, and it speaks volumes about the difference between the two poets. There is, to emphasize the other side of the same coin, no central concern with justice in the Iliad, while it is the very thing that most centrally seems to have concerned Aeschylus. In the Oresteia, the central theme surely is that Clytemnestra thinks that justice demands that she kill the man who has killed their child and who has committed various other outrages. Our feeling that she may be right is built up in the early part of the Agamemnon, where all the many failings of Agamemnon are piled up in reference upon reference. And then after that, the question is raised, was it really just? Did she have the right to do it? And then similar questions arise in connection with Orestes' revenge. And then in the end, a court of law is instituted, and uh, justice, the conception of justice, is in some way codified. Similarly, in the Prometheus, this was no doubt a central theme, the justice or injustice of Zeus. In the end, Zeus has to change his ways, mend his ways, and become more just than he was before. In the suppliant, this question of justice is at the center. What could the wise and just king do? Homer, to be sure, occasionally mentions justice, but by citing, very briefly, three passages in which justice enters, you will see how little he is concerned with moral philosophy. The first is uh, perhaps one of the most gruesome passages, perhaps the most gruesome, in the Iliad, and I hasten to emphasize that it is not characteristic of the Iliad as a whole in its particular content. Uh, My dear Menelaus, he said, why are you so chary of taking men's lives? Did the Trojans treat you as handsomely as that when they stayed in your house? No. We are not going to leave a single one of them alive, down to the babies in their mother's wombs, not even they must live. The whole people must be wiped out of existence, and none be left to think of them and shed a tear. This is Agamemnon speaking, and Agamemnon is not a very attractive character. But the next sentence is, the justice of this made Menelaus change his mind. I don't think this is said ironically in uh, any particularly interested way, but it's just that there is something fitting about this, and this made Menelaus change his mind, and the poet is not interested in moral issues in the same philosophical way in which Aeschylus was. The second reference seems to me equally naive, though not so repulsive. Look at your man, Promachus, put to sleep by my spear and prompt repayment for my brother's death. That is what a wise man prays for, a kinsman to survive him and avenge his fall. Again, quite an unproblematic view of justice. And the last one, Zeus sees Hector putting on the armor of the divine Achilles, and Zeus shakes his head and says to himself, Unhappy man, little knowing how close you are to death, you are putting on the imperishable armor of a mighty man of war before whom all others quail. And it was you that killed his comrade, the brave and lovable Patroclus, and stripped the armor from his head and shoulders with irreverent hands. Well, for the moment, great power shall be yours, but you must pay for it. This pre-philosophical, somewhat naive attitude that in the end you must pay for it is quite typical, I think, of Homer's 
not very philosophical concerning the justice. Indeed, you might say he is particularly uninterested in justice and who is right, the Trojans or the Greeks. This does not concern him. This is a very important difference between Aeschylus on the one hand and Homer on the other. And in this respect, Aeschylus and halfway between Homer and Plato. But not only in this respect. Secondly, Aeschylus believes, as I think Homer did not, in progress through reason. The worldview of the Iliad, I think, is quite different in this respect. Instead of trying to formulate it myself, I'll read a passage from Kittos, H.P. Kittos, taken book from the Greek. He writes, Nor is this clear appreciation of the human scene in Homer, that is, in the Iliad, that is, nor is this clear appreciation of the human scene relieved either by bright hope of a better world hereafter or by any belief in progress. As to the former, the Greek and Homer could look forward to a dim, shadowy life in Hades, and as Achilles said, I would rather be a slave on earth than a king in Hades. The only real hope of immortality was that one's fame might live on in song. As to the latter, proper, it was impossible. For the nature of the gods cannot change, and that the nature of men should change was an idea that occurred to nobody for a long time yet. And even if it did, the gods would still give the two sorrows for every blessing. Life would still remain what it is in all its essential. One can imagine such an outlook so remarkably free from illusion, breeding a resigned and hopeless fatalism. But it was combined with an almost fierce joy in life, the exaltation in human achievement and in human personality. I heartily agree with this formulation, and I will try to illustrate it a little further to show how very right it is. I've emphasized on Aeschylus, especially in Humanities and the Suppliant and Prometheus, we are exhorted, man is exhorted to use his reason to weigh the pros and cons to make an intelligent settlement and thus to solve his problems and to avoid a tragic outcome. In Homer, it seems to me quite different. For example, book four, in which Pandarus breaks the truth, seems to suggest that even if we use our reason to the full, as people had done, they had uh, arranged the truth and everything seemed to be going fine, one man, who in this case is egged on by a goddess, breaks the truth, and in that case, reason doesn't have a chance. Reason cannot save man. Guilt is incurred when and if the god chooses. This view of life that seems to me defined in Homer has been very well formulated in four lines by Goethe. You lead us into life's domain, God, that is, to lead us into life's domain, to catch the poor in guilt and dirt, and then to leave them to pain. Avenge is every guilt on earth. There's no trust in reason and in human settlement in Homer, in the Elgia. It is understood that the finest results of reason can suddenly be overthrown. I said they can be overthrown if it pleases to God, but it might be more accurate to say that when rationality is overthrown, Homer's way of expressing that is to say that one of the gods did it. Toward the end, for example, when Agamemnon and Achilles make a peace to each other, first Agamemnon and then shortly after that Achilles say that they were not to be blamed, that it wasn't really their fault, that it was Arte would be difficult to translate, and that's the best way of understanding what it meant, is just to read it in context. What could I do? At such moments there's a power that takes complete command, Arte, the eldest daughter of Zeus, who blinds us all, a cursed spirit that she is, never touching the ground without the substance of feet of her, but flitting two men's heads, corrupting them, and bringing this one or the other down. Why even Zeus was blinded? by her one. And then there comes a story about how even Zeus was once blinded by Arthur. In 
other words, there are irrational forces in the world against which man reason cannot prevail. Uh, this is expressed, it seems to me, in an interesting way, a couple of times in speeches by Hector. I'll give us two brief quotations. One Hector says, Believe me, fighting and the noise of chariots do not frighten me. But we are all puppets in the hands of eager staring Zeus. In a moment, Zeus can make a brave man run away and lose the battle. And the next day, the same god will spur him on to fight. In a similar passage, that's interesting in a number of ways, I'll comment on only one aspect of it. My lord Achilles, says Hector to Achilles, I know that you are a good man, better by far than myself. But matters like this lie on the knees of the God, and though I am not so strong as you, they may yet decide to let me kill you to the cast of my spear. There is an element of uncertainty in life, and this is greatly stressed by Homer, while Aeschylus rather stresses what reason can accomplish. Perhaps it makes even more sense to you now than it might have when I first said it, but I believe that for Aeschylus, the Battle of Marathon became the paradigm for his worldview. Here it had been proved possible for men with their rational resolve and their courage to turn all the odds against the oracle and against the overwhelming might of the first. This firm pride in one's reason, this reliance on reason, is 